Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Tony Tenori. I'm the Chief of Spine Surgery at Boston University, Boston Medical Center. And uh, we have Dr. Sardar here, Dr. Sardar. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Zishan Sardar. I'm a spine surgeon at uh, Columbia University at the uh, New York Presbyterian Ox Spine Hospital. So uh, we're gonna be talking today about a very prevalent uh, disease, uh, which is osteoporosis. And uh, as a surgeon, uh, we deal with patients all the time with uh, 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 osteoporosis. And how do you know about that? Because uh, sometimes when putting surgery, uh, screws, or doing uh, any deformity correction, uh, we realize that the bone is very soft. How do you go about uh, um, evaluating those patients, screening for those patients, and, 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 and reducing the complications from uh, such uh, uh, disease? Got it, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I try to take um, uh, a pretty generalized approach to all my patients. So whoever is coming in to see me, I do tend to think about their bone health at the back of my mind for everyone, doesn't matter who it is. And so, you know, I do use screening criteria for patients that are coming to see me for the reasons that you mentioned. It is quite prevalent. We do know it's associated with complications. So essentially for me, uh, if I'm doing any kind of instrumentation, if I'm doing putting any metal in the patient, uh, I will uh, definitely uh, think about screening that patient for osteoporosis. Uh, if, it's, if, if they're over the age of 65, uh, they automatically get a bone density scan in my practice. Uh, before I even schedule them for surgery so that I can optimize them. For patients who are between the age of 50 to 65, well, that's where I, I see if they have certain risk factors that would make me uh, get them get a, a, a DEXA scan for them. But those risk factors would include you know, patients who are on chronic steroids, patients who are smokers, uh, patients with kidney failure, uh, patients with higher consumption of alcohol, uh, and those with a history of a fragility fracture, uh, you know, things like that that make them uh, a higher risk of osteoporosis. If they are not known to have it, I will get a bone density scan. I will screen them for osteoporosis uh, prior to surgery. And then you have a very subcategory uh, of patients who are younger, the, younger than 50 uh, who may have metabolic bone diseases or for some reason who are on high, ster high dose steroids. Younger than 50, those are the patients I will screen. Uh, typically, I screen with, uh, bone den with a bone density scan, with a DEXA scan. I do sometimes use a, a uh, well, I mean, you know, anyone who is getting instrumentation, I get a CT scan on for pre-op planning, and I do use that as an adjunct as well to look at their, their Hounsfeld units to see uh, what further information that gives me. But the, initially, for screening, that's the, that's the kind of guideline that I go by. I see. So you don't realize, or you don't use the CT scan sometimes as a replacement, j j only as an adjunct? Because as now a, there's a lot of talk about that you, as being um, um, predictive enough uh, uh, for osteoporosis. Yeah, I, I think I'm not at a point where I use one over the other. So typically I will get, I end up having both. Uh, you know, like I said, bo pretty much all of my patients who are getting some kind of instrumentation, they will have a CT scan for pre artery planning so that I can, if I'm putting screws in or if I'm doing disc replacements, things like that, I will have a CT scan for pre artery planning to, to, for that purpose. And I will use that to look at a CT-based Townsville units as well to get an assessment of their bone quality. On the other hand, I still will, for patients who do fall into that category, which I think is a high risk, I will also get a bone density scan to look, uh, uh, to look at their T-scores and see if they qualify for osteoporosis. One of the key reasons for that is that when you're trying to uh, get authorization for medical treatment for these patients, yeah. insurances are still uh, requiring uh, DEXA scans. I don't think, even though in the medical community we are starting to rely more on CT-based Townsville units, those are not yet accepted by the insurances. So for that purpose, you still have to, for the most part, show the, a T-score and show that they're osteoporotic or uh, show that they have a clinical uh, uh, diagnosis of osteoporosis based on other things as well. So I still get that for those reasons. And the, the last reason I get a DEXA scan is also uh, we know that even though we th these machines are somewhat calibrated, there's still a bit of variation. Yeah. Now, for patients who get a, a quantitative CT, that's very different. You know, those are a bit more standardized. Uh, but patients that we're using the opportunistic CT, uh, that's not as, uh, as uh, standardized yet. It gives us a good estimate, but there's still some variation. So for those reasons, I'll still get a DEXA scan in addition to that. 
Excellent torque from frame. Uh, the question is, okay, you have a patient and you diagnose that they have osteoporosis and you're doing surgery on them. What do you tell them? How long you treat them medically uh, um, before you start the surgery? Yeah. Of course, we're not talking about the emergency surgery that they have to go uh, immediately, uh, but I'm talking about patients who can wait. So what is your sweet spot in how much you, you, you treat them before uh, you, uh, you you get into surgery. Yeah, I think the most one of the most important things is what you mentioned: elective versus emergent. Mm -hmm. So if it's an emergency, it's an emergency. That's a whole different category. For for elective, completely elective patients, where where you have time, uh, there's no impending neurological uh, or uh, 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 instability that you're worried about. In those cases. Uh, I definitely treat them before surgery to optimize their bone health. Uh, we work with our endocrinologists. The duration of surgery, uh, uh, in, uh, to me, varies a, uh, somewhat based on the type of surgery we're doing, yeah. and somewhat also based on how long the patient thinks uh, they can really tolerate their symptoms to optimize. So for instance, if I'm doing a one-level fusion in the lumbar spine, uh, and the patient is osteoporotic, I will have them start treatment for at least two months prior to surgery. That's the minimum. My preference is to go towards six months. Uh, if, the patient's, if the patient can tolerate, I will do six months. If not, the minimum for me is two months. On the other hand, if I'm doing a much larger reconstruction, T10 to pelvis, T2 to pelvis, things like that, those I consider almost six months as the minimum because those are major reconstructions and the, and the effect of osteoporosis on them can be much larger in terms of complications. And those are patients typically who have, you know, our adult population or even our elderly population, they have waited years and years to get to this point where they've now decided that they want to have surgery. So in my mind, obviously discussing with the patients, I want to optimize them for longer so that we have the best outcome for them. So the, the bigger cases I try to tend more towards six months at least, the smaller cases, I, I'm leaning a bit more towards at least two months, but ideally even longer if they can wait for that long. That's very, thank you very much, very helpful. Yeah. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit, Dr. Tenori. Um, we talked a little bit about the pre-op side of things. Uh, let's talk about intra-op. Let's talk about uh, how you manage these patients intra-op and how you optimize these patients intra-op. And I think it'd be useful if we, if we go through different examples. Uh, so let's talk about a patient who you've decided that you're gonna do uh, a reconstruction from, let's say, T10 to pelvis, right. and you've already optimized them uh, with medical Medically. treatment prior to surgery. What is your thinking, uh, what is now your surgical planning, uh, as well as intra-op execution to make sure that you reduce your complications? That's an excellent question. And uh, the way I look at those, uh, let's keep in mind as after you introduce uh, the session, that the majority of those patients are elderly patients. Of course, there are younger patients who have osteoporosis. We're not eliminating those. But the majority of those patients usually are elderly. In the elder, in elderly population, there is something what I call the reversal of biomechanics, meaning if we look carefully at the MRI, the CT scans, or x-rays, we find that the discs are the stiff ones, sometimes bridging osteophytes or near bridging osteophytes, but the bone is weak. So I have to keep, you have to keep in mind that reversal biomechanics so that the, fr the, the, f the fragile part is the vertebrae itself. So we need to do release of the disc and in, in, in through the disc space. And there comes the, um, the interbody uh, effusion part. So I'm treating T10 to S1. I definitely will go with the load sharing concept. I go anteriorly or anterolaterally through the ATP approach and we release a disc and when we put cages, large footprint cages in the front. And the purpose of that is to basically to support the screws from the back. If I wanna rely on the screws posteriorly or on the screws to do the correction and hold that correction, I'm asking too much that spine and to, to my damage. That's one uh, uh, area w which I would do. The other thing also, I think about bone density. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, metal density. So the, 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 the older you get, the more osteoporosis uh, you, uh, you get you are, the less density of the screws I wanna use. And, and the reason of that, I wanna give a softer transition to the uh, uninstrumented segment. So that's why I skip levels, let's say, uh, for the T10 to S1, I do T10, T12, L2, and um, L4 and S1 screws with index fixation uh, to, to answer that. Why it works? Because I have interbody support in the front. 
So that's the second concept. The third concept is that I want to preload or get all my correction in the middle of the deformity, not at the apex or the bottom. So because if you preload, uh, uh, if you use the edges of your um, hardware to do the correction, it's inevitably they're going to cut out, and, and they're going to they're going to cut out. So I do most of my corrections at the bottom, and then leave the top just kind of hanging there. I basically doing no no uh, no uh, pulling out at all on the hardware. And uh, lastly, of course, if you could use a minimally invasive principles, meaning preserving the muscles, the fascia, and all the supporting structures, I'm a minimally invasive surgeon, and this is great for this uh, sort of application. And uh, last point is that for you know, you don't want to be too greedy. You don't want to get too much correction uh, for those patients. If you get too much correction on those patients, the spine always wants to go back where it was, and you know you the, the, you you have very high rate of uh, uh, adjacent segment disease or proximal junction kyphosis or proximal fracture, which is even uh, uh, more uh, serious. Yeah, perfect, excellent points. Uh, how does your approach change in the cervical spine? I mean, we talk a lot about obviously the thoracic spine, lumbar spine, big deformities, but let's say you're, doing, you're planning to do a two-level anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Does osteoporosis play a role in your management of those patients? Yes, but uh, to a lesser extent, uh, because the, the mechanical the forces are a, a lot less exaggerated you know, compared to the thoracic or thoracic or thoracic uh, lumbar spine. But I certainly would go with the load sharing. Same thing, you know, I'm going with the um, use. I use uh, iliac bone graft, whether allograft or autograft. You know, if they are osteoporotic, I would go with the allograft just to support. But also, I use a plate anteriorly. So this is same kind of concept. You know, interbody support, doing all the work. The heavy work, the plate is is a is a, um, a neutralizing device uh, to uh, load support, or you, you could do anterior posterior. You know, the support from the front, go from the back, put screws and, and so on. And if I, if the let's say case with the, the cervical disease and um, I, you have to go posteriorly, then of course I'll go posteriorly. And I realize at, at that time I use let's say pedicle screws rather than using a lateral mass screws. Um, uh, so, so you have to be a lot more vigilant about um, the, the soft bone and how much you're, correction, you're correcting. If somebody with a se severe sagittal imbalance, th that's when for a cervical spine, that will, will earn definitely anterior posterior uh, fixation just to support in the front and go from the back. If somebody is already to me, can already balance, so all what I need is to add the screws. I will only go posteriorly if, if uh, the dose is acceptable. Uh, or if it's, you know, an, also, I can go interiorly as well, but I have the choice. Right. Yeah, great points again. And I guess just to wrap up, one last question, one last case. Uh, what do you do for your the typical common osteoporotic old patient with a degenerative spondylolisthesis that you're trying to fuse? So it's a one level thing you're going to do. How does does that how does that play into your treatment now? Uh, you know, having discussed it before the load sharing, I would go with that as well. Uh, if, but uh, sometimes you know, we, we did not talk about cement augmentation, which is, I think it's it's very helpful utilitarian in this uh, kind of uh, scenarios where, you know, you have a. I would keep my screw density low, but I would increase the purchase at every level of those. So I use cement augmentation for those screws, even though I'm using fewer screws because I want the rod to be slightly more flexible. For one level fusion, I try to go anterior posterior, preferably minimally invasive. Uh, if I find the bone if, uh, very soft, I use a cement augmentation um, as well. And um, yes, we do have our subsidence case, uh, you know, with those. I try to, you know, to be very careful with the end plate preparation. Um, I do all the anterior release uh, first before I start spreading the vertebra because we know that the bone is very soft. So the minute it creeps, then you, you lost your battle for, from that perspective. Um, so um, extra vigilant about the um, end plate violation. And if I feel the bone is soft, then cement augmentation from the back. Great. So I think just to wrap up, we'll, we'll go over uh, a bit of the key points we, we talked about today. Uh, we talked about that screen is obviously a prevalent disease uh, in our elderly population. So screening is, is extremely important uh, in our elderly population, especially when we're using instrumentation. Um, uh, treatment prior to surgery is important. The duration may depend on what we are trying to do, but treatment prior to surgery in elective cases is important to, to optimize the bone health. And then Dr. Tenori shared his tips on 
on how to optimize the outcome intra-op, uh, and maybe not aim for uh, the, the, the most correction in the elderly patients yeah. uh, to avoid uh, uh, things like proximal injection kyphosis or fracture, uh, uh, load sharing circumferential constructs uh, to, sh to share the load, uh, maybe keeping a lower screw density um, uh, in osteoporotic patients to, again, not make the construct too stiff. Um, and, and I think just using combination of things, we talked about cement a little bit as well in, in patients where we feel the fixation may not be very good. So I think those are you know, hopefully good uh, practical uh, uh, tips that people can use in their practice to optimize the patient's pre-op and hopefully optimize them intra-op as well. So thank you very much, Dr. Tenori, uh, for, for all your tips. Thank you, thank you, thank you for you. And uh, I, I want to reiterate one point. It's, it's, a, it's a metabolic disease. It's a disease before it gets to the spine as a surgeon. So we need to treat the disease first. And I agree with the Sardar, Dr. Sardar about the medical treatment is far more important than the surgical treatment for those patients. Thank you very much. Thank you.